a one-dimensional system is you're just moving along a line. Two dimensions is you're moving in a plane. And then three dimensions is you're moving in space. But then if you add for robots, you also have to think about you have an object in space, you have its position in space, but then there's also their orientation in space. That's three more degrees of freedom. So there's six degrees of freedom from an object moving in space. But now if you add all the nuances, let's say of a hand with fingers, you now have maybe 20 degrees of freedom. So now each time you do that, you think of a higher dimensional space. And each one of those is much bigger. It grows you know, exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. So if you look at language, it's actually a beautiful example of this because it's really linear. It's one dimensional. Hmm. Language is a sequence, a string of, of words. And the set of words is relatively small. I mean, it's something like 20,000 words are typically used in, let's say, English. And so you're now looking at combinations of all different combinations of those 20,000 words in a linear sequence. Huge, vast number, but it's much smaller than the combination of motions that can occur in space because those are many infinities greater than the number of, of sentences that can be put together. Hi, listeners. This is Luisa Rodriguez, one of the hosts of the 80,000 Hours podcast. In today's episode, I speak with roboticist Ken Goldberg about how far away we are from a Jetsons-like future with robot helpers in every aspect of society and whether the current buzz around robotics is realistic or just wishful thinking. We talk about what the cutting-edge robots of today can do and the areas where they still struggle, why it's actually much easier for machines to learn language than it is for them to manipulate objects in the real world, where we should expect to see robot labor in the coming decades, like warehouses, agriculture, and medicine, and how much human workers should be worried, plus lots more. As you'll hear, Ken doesn't put much weight on AI causing an intelligence explosion and that kind of speeding up the progress in robotics. And we didn't spend our time debating that because I wanted to learn as much from him as I could about the current state of the art and bottlenecks in robotics as he sees it. But if you want to hear the case for an intelligence explosion and haven't listened to it yet, I highly recommend episode 191, Carl Schulman on the economy and national security after AGI. All right, without further ado, I bring you Ken Goldberg. Today, I'm speaking with Ken Goldberg. Ken is a professor and the William S. Floyd Junior Distinguished Chair in Engineering at UC Berkeley, a co-founder and chief scientist at robotics startups Ambi Robotics and Jacoby Robotics, and also a well-known artist. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Ken. Thank you, Louisa. It's a pleasure. So I'm hoping to talk about the impact robots will have on society and why we don't have better robots already. But first... AI seems increasingly on its way to becoming general purpose. Is robotics headed in the same direction? I guess, to what extent is it on track to kind of master a bunch of human tasks? <laughs> Good. All right. This is, a, this is a, something I, I think is really important, and, and I feel a, somewhat of a professional responsibility to provide some perspective on this, because... Like everyone else, I'm I'm watching the news. I'm seeing the announcements by Elon Musk and and Jensen Wong from Nvidia, and this sort of huge wave of optimism around around robots. And I don't want to be a negative, <laughs> but I think it's really important to, to inject some realism into the into the conversation. And so, what I mean by that is that we are making progress. There's a lot of reasons to be excited about these new developments, in particular, deep learning and generative AI and the, these large models. But there's also, there's a number of really deep and fundamental challenges in robotics. My specialty is in robotics, so I, I can really speak to that and why I feel that some of the the expectations are exaggerated. And I worry that there's a consequence to that, which is if we're not careful, the, the, these exaggerations will 
essentially blow up and we'll have a, a huge a huge decline, basically a bubble will burst and then there'll be a lot of negative response, whiplash essentially. So I want to put things into perspective. Great. Yeah. I guess, so I want to ask about the bubble. Um, first, for anyone who doesn't follow the news as closely, um, what are the kinds of things, uh, you mentioned Tesla and NVIDIA, that uh, are kind of giving the sense of robotics hype? Okay. Well, it's really, there's been, you know, there's these various waves of excitement around AI and robotics over the years. And generally, I want to be supportive of those. I, obviously, they're they're very good for our field in that they bring a lot of attention and and interest and resources for us to do research. So I'm I'm not opposed to those. But what what's happened is that in the last six months, there's been a huge surge of interest in humanoids, in particular. That Jensen Wong went on on stage and had, was surrounded by nine different humanoids and basically said this is coming <laughs> you know and this is the future and he's very very trusted authority because he was right about GPUs and he's you know his his company is one of the fastest growing if not the fastest growing and most successful company in the world and similarly Elon Musk has been talking about about humanoids for several years so he's very compelling and you know he's been very successful in in space and number of other you know he's made tesla very successful so i think people trust them and they 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 believe that they have a vision of what's coming and i think this also meshes with the ongoing and long standing challenge which is that science fiction has been talking about and portraying realistic human like robots for generations. Right. So that's in our that's in our in our sort of subconscious. We've seen these things before, so they don't feel unreal to us. And we're sort of like, okay, that it seems like, well, it if it, it should it should happen any day. Why hasn't it even happened so far? Right? That's the big question. Like why why what are we waiting for? Yeah. Um why what's taking so long? And that that's the fundamental I, I, I want to be able to address that question. Great. Okay, so you're worried about there being a bubble. Um, can you kind of flesh out the negative consequences if that bubble were to burst? So if, you know, there was a bunch of robotics hype and then in the next decade, the hype didn't kind of play out and, you know, I'm sure the field will advance, but maybe we don't get the kinds of advances people are expecting given, for example, the advances in LLMs recently. Yeah, what would be the costs of that? Good. So there's there's a well-known pattern known as the Gartner hype cycle, which basically looks like, you know, there's a big rise of expectations, then there's a peak of expectations, then there's a, a trough of disillusionment <laughs> where the expectations are not met and people really end up feeling very frustrated and essentially betrayed that they they were they were led to believe something that doesn't pan out. And mm. then they essentially, they throw the baby out with a the bathwater. They, they say, oh, well, this whole thing is just hype and there's nothing there. And then the field goes into what we would call a winter season. And then there's a lot of, you know, funding dries up, interest dries up. And then, you know, that may last quite a long time until the next cycle starts. <laughs> right, right, right. But also generally what happens is that there's some renewed uh, development years later that is actually real and comes gradually and doesn't ever live up to the great expectations, but lives up to something that's reasonably important and significant. And a perfect example of this is the internet pattern. So the early days of the internet, and you're too young to remember this, but it was when there was huge excitement, this is going to change the world, world peace, all of these things. And then there was a bubble and it burst around the year 2000 and all of these companies went bankrupt. There was a lot of um, sense that this was, this was just all hype. And that somewhat lasted for years and then it slowly ramped up. And now, of course, the internet is very significant but obviously also has a number of unintended consequences. But what what I want to say is in terms of 
language models have had this huge uh, burst of, of development. Right. And so what I see as technology is not developed in terms of exponential growth. That is extremely rare. And the only, the, the counterexample everyone will talk about is Moore's Law in terms of microchips. And that is truly, that is surprising, shocking that it's continued this long and it keeps doubling every 18 months. That is amazing. And, but I think it's very hard to find another example of anything like that. And so we're, for, for other things, we want that exponential, you know, people like to talk about it, but in the reality is it doesn't, it re- almost never works out to be exponential. Sure. Now, in artificial intelligence, there's been, it, it's complicated because of the fact that this is a technology that everybody, in a sense, feels they know because they've seen it on TV and, you know, in books. And, you know, I grew up with, with the Jetsons, like, you know, where we, we you know, jetpacks and uh, robots were, you know, it was, it was around the corner. And so the, that's where these things are, you know, very visible, whereas some technologies like quantum computing is something people don't have much experience with. They don't know. They don't have expectations around it because they just don't really, you know, right? It's not, that's not really portrayed very commonly or it's not very easy to visualize. But robots are. And so we all have a, a, a history of robotics in our, in our minds. And in fact, it goes way back to the ancient Egyptian, Egyptians and ancient Greeks, Pygmalion story, up through the Golem, Frankenstein, right? All of these, there's a beautiful history of archetypes around this idea of artificial creatures that almost always run amok and cause great suffering by their creators. That, that, that archetype is repeated over and over and over again in so many different stories. And so it's really deeply rooted, at least in the Western imagination, we, we also fear them, right? We, we want them, but we also fear them. So there's this very complex relationship we have with robots. So, yeah, this kind of vision people have that is very influenced by media of humanoid robots who help us do all sorts of things, like in the Jetsons, is your view that that it's going to take a long time to get to anything like that uh, and that we're currently kind of expecting too much in the short term? Or is your view more that that's just like a pretty unrealistic expectation for any time in the foreseeable, I don't know, several <laughs> decades? So I think there's there is certainly grounds for optimism. There's been a number of breakthroughs. And I can go through what I see as breakthroughs over the last 20 years. What... I also see is there's gaps between our ability to do certain things like manipulation tasks. Those are very challenging. And we can go into why those are challenging and that that it's not clear that any of those breakthroughs are going to solve those, those problems. Now, there may be new breakthroughs, and I would love that to be, I would love those to happen. But I also want to be realistic about the challenges that are here. I think the, the big point is, Whereas although Tesla and NVIDIA and others are saying, we now have all the ingredients, now it's going to happen, I don't think that's true. We do not have the ingredients. We have new ingredients. There's several new technologies that we can put to place, but those ingredients are not sufficient to solve the problems that I believe are still incredibly challenging, which is manipulating objects the way humans do. Yeah, I want to come back to kind of what robots can and can't do in a bunch of detail in a bit. But the thing that I've, the like vague picture I've gotten the sense of from your work and from learning a bit about this topic is just, it feels to me like we've achieved something closer to general purpose, yeah, thinking machines in LLMs than we have in robotics, as far as I've seen. And yeah, we'll talk about examples of this, but it's things like, motion, depth perception, grasping, which is the thing that you work on, are all so much more difficult than I would have expected when I, Mm -hmm. you know, when I've started to watch videos of the kind of state of the art of these types of tasks. And one, I'm curious if you kind of agree that that's roughly right. um, But also, if it is, yeah, why has it been so much easier to create 
algorithms that can imitate human language than it has been to create robots that can imitate human motions, like grasping. Good. Okay, so there's no doubt that the the breakthrough of large language models is one of these punctuated moments, right? Where it's it's a it's a it's a major major breakthrough, and I absolutely want to acknowledge that importance of that. My my sense of that is that it is largely that this model is very good at interpolation, meaning that if you give it enough data, it is able to interpolate. And that is, respond in ways that are consistent with those patterns in the past. And it's not just repeating, it's definitely creating things that are novel. And I would say it's astoundingly good at, at, at things that surprise me. For example, creativity in the sense of being able to write poetry or come up with novel sentences and essentially stories. But this is a this is what I mean by interpolation, right, is that it's sort of able to take things it's seen and combine them in interesting ways. Now, it has to have sufficient data to be able to to do this. And I think what's the big surprise is that the amount of data that's been collected on the internet, the terabytes of data that's out there, has turned out to be sufficient to achieve this level of of surprising performance. And so the analogous thing with robotics would be something like uh, take all the data we have, let's say videos that involve grasping, and see if you can use that to train a model of what it means to grasp and teach a robot to do that. Is it just the case that that hasn't worked or doesn't seem like it will work for reasons that might not be obvious? Good. So you're right. So that's actually the hope right now. And that's part of the the excitement right now is that we can do an analogous thing with robotics. In other words, if we see enough of a sequences of robots manipulating, that we can then start to, it can learn to manipulate novel scenarios. And so this is, this is what's behind these major efforts. And one of them is, is headed by Google DeepMind, that's the, the cross-embodiment or robot transformer project, which is to collect vast data sets. And in this case, the data has to be a combination of words, video, and control signals to the robot. That is, we need to know what's the robot doing in parallel with the images and text. So... Those those examples you can't find on YouTube or anywhere because on YouTube you have videos, and it's true, you have many videos of, of, of humans manipulating things, but we then we, we have to extract the motions of the of the human hands and then figure out how to map those onto robots. Right. So there's a lot of challenges and even just seeing what's happening in a in a scene is very challenging. So that's the hope, though, and there's a lot of excitement around it. There's this major efforts underway to collect large data sets and some very preliminary results that suggest that something can work. But, and this is where I've been particularly skeptical, I would say, of the extrapolation that many people are doing, saying, okay, we've seen this result now, it would just, you know, in, in next year or so, we'll be ready to, this will start generalizing and you'll have emergent general purpose robots. And I can go through what I see as my con- concerns or my, my skepticism about this, but I have a, t- I'm giving a, this talk that's called, is data all we need? Question mark. Uh, large robot models and good old fashioned engineering. In a nutshell, that sort of tells you where I'm thinking. And a lot of roboticists are agreeing with me that this is, that data is not all we need, that we actually need need to combine with engineering. And we're going to need, because the data is not available at the scale that we would need, because it's a very high dimensional problem. Yeah, I want to understand that bit better, the kind of difference between the physical problems and the problem that is kind of stringing words together to make coherent thoughts and creative thoughts. 
One explanation for this is called Moravec's paradox. I'll try to give my understanding of it, and then you can you can tell me where I'm wrong and add to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of an evolutionary explanation. Older skills like motion and depth perception have had kind of more time for natural selection to hone a particular design, whereas more recent skills like language seem hard to us not because they're inherently difficult, but because they're just relatively newer to us. Um, is that an explanation that you buy or put weight on? Well, yes and no. First of all, I want to separate more of X paradox into the paradox itself and then possible explanation for the paradox. Okay, because more of X paradox is, 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 can simply be summed up as what's, what's hard for humans, like lifting heavy objects, is easy for robots. And what's easy for humans, like stacking some blocks on a table or cleaning up a clearing a, a, after a dinner party, is very hard for robots. Now, that's the paradox, and it's been true for 30, 35 years since Hans Moravec, who's still around, he's based in Pittsburgh, he, he observed this and he correctly labeled it as a paradox because it's, it is counterintuitive, right? Why should, why should we have this differential? But it, it's still true today. So the paradox itself is undeniable, I think. And, um, but the, why is this paradox is, is, is very interesting question. And you raise one possible explanation about evolution that we have been, humans have had the benefit of millions of years of evolution. We've evolved these reactions and these sensory capabilities that are giving us that fundamental stratum substrate that lets us perform these tasks. And and you're right, and that speaking language is much more recent comparatively and i can tell you from one perspective let's take it from a from from the dimensionality perspective so this means how many degrees of freedom do you have in a system right so a one dimensional system is you're just moving along a line two dimensions is you're moving in a plane and then three dimensions is you're moving in space but then if you add for robots you also have to think about you have an object in space you have its position in space Right, so here's my glasses, and there, there's a position in space, but then there's also their orientation in space. Yep, yep. So that's, that's three more degrees of freedom. So there's six degrees of freedom from an object moving in space. So that's what we t- typically talk about with robots. Robot, that's why robots need at least six joints to right. be able to achieve an arbitrary position and orientation in space. So that's six degrees of freedom. But now if you add all the nuances, let's say, of a hand... With fingers, you now have maybe 20 degrees of freedom, right? So now each time you do that, you think of a higher dimensional space. And each one of those is much bigger. It grows, you know, exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. Now, that is an exponential. Okay, that's, there's no doubt about it. That's a real exponential. <laughs> it exists there. Yes. Yep. And so if you look at language, it's actually a beautiful example of this because it's really linear. It's one dimensional. Hmm. Language is a sequence, a string of, of words. And the set of words is relatively s- small. I mean, it's something like 20,000 words are typically used in, a, in, let's say, English. And so you're now looking at combinations of all different combinations of those 20,000 words in a linear sequence. So th- there's many, you mean a huge, vast number, but it's much smaller than, say, the combination of motions that can occur in space, right? Because those are, you know, there's just, it's, it's many infinities greater than the number of, of, of sentences that can be put together. That was so beautifully explained for me. I feel like I had like some understanding of <laughs> kind of what your answer might be here, but that was super, super clear and helped me understand way better. Well, I, th- I, I appreciate that. I, what I think is it's hard to wrap our heads around these these complexity of these problem spaces the we call it the state space of different problems and so when we look at a, a sentence or something produced by chat gpt it's very novel and interesting and surprising to us and it's hard for us to step back and realize well it's seen so many examples of that pattern, similar patterns. So it's 
reached a critical mass and is now able to start to generate, generalize. Again, we talk about generalization within distribution and, and outside the distribution. So you understand that difference. What, that within distribution is you've seen a whole bunch of points. Imagine that you, the, you've seen a bunch of examples on a, um, I actually think of it as a, a target. You're doing target practice and you're putting a bunch of points all around. And now you want to pick a new point that's somewhere within that, those points you've, you've sampled and you're pretty able to, to hit those points. But now all of a sudden you have a target that's way off, you know, 20, 20 yards off to the left. Well, now those, all those samples are not helping you because you're in a new domain you haven't seen before. So that's called out of distribution generalization. And that's very hard because you don't have any basis to go, to go there. So you need to be able to sample well within the, the, the distribution. In that case, the dartboard is two-dimensional because you're taking those samples, right? And in robotics, imagine that being 20 or higher dimensional right. degrees of freedom, right? And now you need a lot of uh, samples there. And that's why the, the objective of, of reaching that is very daunting, that you need enormous, vast, you know, unimaginable quantities of examples to be able to do something analogous to what, we're, what, we're, what has been done with language. Right. No, it makes tons of sense. When I imagine kind of a large language model having strings of text, yeah, I mean, it just is a single dimension. Whereas when I imagine a robot trying to learn from YouTube videos, and I'm like, well, how do you exactly define what that hand is doing to lift something up? Like, I'm looking at it two-dimensionally, and so it feels like it should be not that complicated. I just can see the image of the hand. But when I think about what's actually happening, it's it's thumbs, it's joints, it's ligaments, it's muscles, and all of that, I guess, is happening in a way that's, one, hard to see, and two, hard to notice in us as humans because it's so subconscious for us. Right. Um, but actually, it just is fundamentally incredibly complex. And so it it seems ridiculous to me, honestly, that, um, you know, we have, we have large language models, but we don't have robots that could really reliably crack an egg, for example. But as soon as you actually break down what cracking an egg is, I start to actually be able to grapple with why. Good. Well, Louisa, I think you just captured you know, very, you articulated why there's this excitement out there. Because mm, I think yeah. many people see exactly what you just described, which is languages seem so complex and it seems to be now we had this breakthrough. So it seems like a very short step to getting robot robotics to do something similar. And the, as you said, just being able to watch a human cracking an egg the perception of that is so nuanced and complex. We don't have the ability now to watch a video and tell you where, what is all the things moving around inside that video. Right. Humans do that, as you said, subconsciously. We just do it effortlessly. And it's because we have somehow this ability to look at this two-dimensional image and, and in our minds expand it into, we see it, we perceive it as a three-dimensional experience. And that's, that's amazing. Right. And somehow we're doing that with like shadows and right. who knows what else, depth perception, all sorts of things in ways that if I were to try to imagine what that m meant to mathematically model that um, or to try to, you know, put a bunch of points uh, on a grid or something, it becomes actually kind of a mind blowing <laughs> um, problem. It is mind blowing. And, and one thing, but one thing I want to also point out is that one glimmer of hope in this, which is that we have seen that it is possible to compress images dramatically with neural networks. And this is something called an autoencoder, and it's a beautiful result. It's, it's a very simple idea. You take an image on one end and the same image on the other end of a neural network, and you basically try and train the image to go the, the, the network to go down and squeeze that image down into something very small and then reconstruct a large image from that. That turns out that, with, with, that you can train that with a fairly reasonable number of images and then it, it's able to do that. Now, wow. that is amazing because what it's saying is it's somehow finding structure in these images that's able to recreate so that, you know, when you look at the space of all the images out there, 
right? We, that's unimaginably large. But what we're able to show is that with, these, with this autoencoder is that you can squeeze this down to, say, 100 or 200 bits, which is amazing, amazingly compact. So it says that all these images um, have a structure built into them. Right. I'm going to see if I understand that. And I'm going to, I'm going to try an analogy that tell me if it's totally going in the wrong direction. But if I were to try to describe an image very literally, maybe I would try to describe every point, every pixel as a color or something. But I could instead try to distill it by describing kind of concepts or a structure in it. Um, and I can do that with language. And maybe these systems do that in some other way that doesn't look like language to me. Um, but so instead of describing the pixels, you can describe it's a cat on a red background, which is a much simpler, uh, more concise way of describing the image. And then you can build it back up. Is that a reasonable analogy? It is, yes. And you're saying by just a few words, you can describe an image. Now, you know, the, the old adage is an image is, is worth a thousand words. Right. Right. Now, um, but even, even a thousand words is mar far more compact than the representation of if you had to represent an image in full detail. The other way you can think about it is this, that we can take images and we can uh, blur them and compress them down. So I can do a very pixelated vision of you right now, and I'd still be able to see that, it, you know, who it is, that's a, that it's a young woman and she's talking to me and smiling. And so you can see all these things because you, you can pick up things with far less information than the full detail of the image. Right. And the reason I bring this up is that it is a sign that it, there may be, when, when we talk about all the dimensions and everything else, it may turn out that we don't need all those dimensions and all that accuracy to do these things. Yeah, so that's what I say is a glimmer of hope because that that is significant and is... If if we are able to really compress things, and for example, motions may be similar, that robot motions and, and actions of objects might be similar, that we actually don't need the, all these dimensions, which the evidence for this is that somehow the human brain, of course, is the perfect, you know, the, the existence proof that these things are doable. And maybe that's where the breakthrough might happen. And we might be able to to suddenly represent things in a much more compact way. And now all of a sudden you have a much smaller state space to work with. And now you need far less examples to have a good, a good coverage of that state space. And that's, that, could, that could lead to another breakthrough. And this comes back to, Louisa, what I was saying at the beginning, which is there are some big open questions right now. And so the, the development of large language models is a huge one and it has made a, a, a huge breakthrough in, in natural language processing. But it doesn't, that alone is not sufficient to solve the robotics problem. And so these other breakthroughs are needed, and I just don't know when they're going to come. I, don't, I, I think that's the danger is that we expect, you know, the, 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 the hype, as I'm saying, is that saying, okay, we have all the, the tools we need. It's going to happen, you know, in a couple of years. And my point is, no, we're missing some key tools. I don't know when those are going to come. And they might be 10, 20, 30 years before we, we get those. Yep. Okay. Um, that's, yeah, that's a really helpful concrete, I guess not a prediction you're making, but it's something <laughs> like, a, those are plausible timelines too. Um, the next couple of years isn't the inevitable timeline. Exactly. Exactly. So what I want to say is, I'm not saying this will never happen. And- mm -hmm. I, and it may happen sooner than than I'm than I'm saying. I would welcome that. I'd be happy to be wrong, <laughs> but uh, but but I also think we have to be we we just have to be calibrated that we're if we start to say things are going to happen, they, they require certain breakthroughs that we don't have in place. Then you know that's that's a that's a speculation, and. You just, you, you know, history shows that you just can't will that into being. You can't just say, we need this, it's going to happen. There's breakthroughs take time. Bringing it back to where we are with robotics now, I feel like I now have a sense of kind of 
a set of tasks that robots can and can't do right this moment. But I still don't feel like I have a great sense of the big picture. So I'd love to get more of an overview from you. In general, what are the kind of characteristics of tasks that robots have been able to master? Okay, good. Well, I would start by saying there's two areas that have been very successful for robots in the past decade. The first is quad rotors, that is drones. And those are that was a major set of breakthroughs that were really in the hardware and control areas and that allowed these robots, flying robots, drones, to be able to hover stably in in space. And then once you could get them to to hover, you could start to control their movement very precisely. And that has been a remarkable set of developments. And now you see spectacular results of this, where if you've seen some of these drone sort of sky exhibitions, right, where they're, they're in formations moving around in three dimensions, and it's incredible. Yeah, they're incredible. Yeah. And that has also been, they've been very useful for inspection and for photography. They're extremely widely used in Hollywood and in, in you know, just in home sales. They're typically drones fly around and give you these aerial views. So that, that's been a, a really big development. And there, there's a lot of beautiful technology behind that. What another one, interestingly, is also is quadrupeds, which are four-legged robots. And those are the dogs like you see from Boston Dynamics was really a pioneer there. But now there's many, many of those. And in fact, there's a Chinese company that sells one for about $2,000 on eBay, uh, Unitree. And they're, it's amazing because they've pretty much gotten very similar functionality. It's not as, as uh, robust and smaller, more lightweight, but it has the ability to walk over a very complex terrain you can take it outside. It will climb over, you know, uh, rubble and things like that, fairly in, in rocks and things very, very well. And it just works out of the box. Cool. So that was, again, a result of a, a number of things. It was, it was new advances in motors and the, the, the hardware, but also in the control. And here there were a lot of nuances in being able to control the legs and learning played a key role there. In particular, this technique called model predictive control, which is an older technique, but had combined with, with deep learning, was able to address that problem and, and basically get these systems to be able to walk over very complex terrain and adapt and even jump over things. And uh, you can probably see that you can, they can fall, roll down some stairs and get up and keep going. So they can roll over, they can, they can, uh, I've, in some cases do a backflip, which is really incredible. Yeah, I think I've seen a video of that one. And it is, yeah, really, really surprised me. It's funny because I would have thought that that was that set of problems. Um, because I've I've seen this kind of the quadrupedal robot spot, which is the one by Boston Dynamics. I've seen it kind of walk across like rocks and snow and through kind of, yeah, like you said, this really rough terrain. And that seems like it would have been a really hard problem to me. Is this an area where it's not as hard as it looks or is it hard, but we've just, we focused really hard on it and made a bunch of progress? Well, that's a great question. So I'll address both of these. First in the quad rotor, the beauty of it is that you're moving in, in open space. So you don't have to make contact with anything. And so it turns out that that's much easier to do. It's just avoiding everything and staying stable. It's non-trivial, but it's, it's, it's not as hard as making contacts. Now, in, in walking, in legged robots, quadrupeds, you do have to make contacts. And so you're right. I would say that's a harder problem. And it was solved subsequent to quad rotors. And it's, it's been interesting. I think you're right. It was surprising that you could get these to be so stable and so adaptive and to run so fast. That was, I, I would say, it's, it's interesting because you do have to make contacts. You have to coordinate, in this case, four legs and maintain balance and move them, you know, adapt their movements quite rapidly to maintain because you have gravity pulling on you. So as you're moving, you have to be very responsive. But it turned out that that, in some way, was learnable. 
and that you could see enough conditions that it would adapt to the that that it was not too hard and that in some sense i guess that, that you know we talked about the training the training space right the um dimensionality of the of the problem the state space and for these robots there seems that there's a lot of there's some tolerance in other words there's a, a number of conditions but they're all somewhat similar in that the legs can don't have to learn every single possible condition they can sort of be approximate the conditions and the, that they're feeling so if the robot is tilted just slightly and it does some motion that usually works even if the exact arrangement of pebbles or 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 um sticks or things underneath it are not quite the same so that means that you the state space is lower than we you might think yeah in that yeah case. yeah no that makes sense it's like stumbling around is pretty good relative to the like really kind of high level balance that we have when we when we walk and run stumbling around gets you a good chunk of the way there. Whereas I guess for cracking an egg, uh, there's not much room for error. Okay, so let's talk about that because good. And I like what you said, gets you pretty far. That's a great way, that's a great way to put it, Louisa. That's exactly right. What you talk, think about this is like, how far do you need to go to get performance that is tolerable? So there's these two aspects. One is the dimensionality of the state space and the second is fault tolerance, right? And so in um, in quad rotors, drones, there's a very fairly low dimensional because you're just dealing with the six dimensional motion in that space. You're just floating around, um, and you're fairly fault tolerant uh, in the sense that you, if you if you're not perfectly balanced in, in one location and you stray a little bit, you can recover from that easily. Now, of course, if you if you bump into another quad rotor, that's very bad and you could you could crash so that's there's not to tolerance to everything but certain a lot of things you can tolerate and the same i think is true for for walking now let's talk about manipulation and your a cracking the egg example now first i want to raise an interesting point which is when we talk about eggs people often think well it's amazing if your robot can pick up an egg without cracking it right and now but but i challenge you if you take a, an egg out of the refrigerator and just put it in your hand and try and crack it by squeezing it's very very hard to crack an egg that way you it, it's easy to crack it as soon as you tap it onto something right so but if you just squeeze it it's evolved amazingly well to be very very resistant to just like being crushed so when you see a robot pick up an egg, don't be super, super impressed, okay? <laughs> That's not that big of a deal. But if now, if you want to see a robot actually cracking the egg and getting the yolk out, right, like the way a chef would crack an egg. That's, that's manipulation. And that's where I say it's very hard because now you have contacts and you have friction and you have deformations and you have to manage a lot of nuance so that the, the, the things don't drop. And that turns out to be very, very tricky and even higher dimensional and less fault tolerant because a one millimeter error in the position of your contact can makes often makes a difference between holding something and dropping it. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That actually makes me curious. I like that we can think about it in terms of tasks that are um, kind of very multidimensional and very fault intolerant in kind of one quadrant um, and then the opposite quadrant uh, or the diagonal quadrant being very fault tolerant and fewer dimensions. Are there other things in the, the really difficult quadrant, uh, very fault intolerant and very multidimensional? I really like that, Louisa. It's a great way to thinking about it. So let's imagine we have two axes. We have the low dimensional to high dimensional as the horizontal axis going from left to right. Low is on the left and high dimensional is going off to the right. And then we have another axis, which is amount of how tolerant the system is to faults. So going up is very tolerant and going down is very intolerant. So then in the upper left, you might have something like drones. They're tolerant and they're lower dimensional, right? Because they just have the six dimensions. But and, and dogs, because they have more legs, they're also fairly low dimensional, but less, they have more dimensions, but they're also fairly tolerant, as we're saying. Now, logistics is where you have a robot picking up packages. I would put that in the upper right quadrant, 
which is where you have things that are very tolerant and a little bit higher dimension because you actually are making these contacts. Right. But the kind of manipulation you're asking about, like home, picking up things at home, and that that's interesting because there's where you get into higher dimensions because you have complex objects and more nuances. So that may also be in the right upper right quadrant, but sort of further to the right of logistics. And then something like surgery is in the lower right. That is very difficult. That's where you have very high dimensions and you have, it's fairly intolerant to errors. So those are really, really hard things. These things in the lower right, high dimension and not fault tolerant environments. And that's where, you know, I think a lot of manipulation, if you're thinking about things like even just cleaning up your dinner table, you might say, well, it's very difficult because it, it, is, it is fault intolerant in that you can drop glassware and break it, right? And so that's not acceptable. And so these kind of problems are very challenging. And I would add one element also, maybe it's a third axis on this uh in this nice sure. categorization which is just in case anyone thought our quadrants were too easy too simple yeah exactly so uh well let's go into a third dimension and say that we have we have the the, the challenge of sensing the environment mm, okay and the perception difficulty and that that would be where some things are much easier to perceive if you have a nice, fairly static and um, opaque environment and clear contrast between things. And then you have things where there's a dynamic environment, let's say underwater or actually even traffic, right, where you're, it's very things are moving around or around you. It, it makes it really challenging. Or in a surgery, right, the whole body is actually moving because you're breathing and your heart's beating. So doing a surgery is, uh, is, very, is very challenging. So, so that dimension, perception in the body is very tricky with um, fluids and blood and glistening materials. And so finding things and um, perceiving them is very difficult. So that axis is, is another one. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because it was another case where when I was kind of learning a little bit about the state of things um, in preparation for speaking with you, sensing kind of came up and I was like, sensing can't be that hard still. Um, but then you kind of show that like looking at a glass, like, I don't know how we do it. If you look at a glass, it is mostly clear. You're just getting like a couple of places where light is reflecting in a slightly different way that makes it easier to see. But like, actually, if I were to, yeah, try to tell a robot uh, how to perceive a glass, it would, it would seem like an extremely hard problem to me. And it seems like there just are loads of different ways this kind of thing can be hard, whether it's clarity or yeah, something like contrast or different lights and reflections. So yeah, another another example of this paradox, I guess. Definitely. And it's interesting because you we understand how glasses are shaped roughly and their properties. So we kind of have a have a way of feeling about them. And then the other thing that I believe is really important is how humans operate with we also, like robots, have limited perception abilities and limited control abilities, right? So we make errors. But the, what we've, we, we've learned somehow is, over years of evolution is how to compensate for these errors. And so when we pick up a glass, we don't just put our gripper right up next to it and close it. We, we sort of scoop it. And by that, I mean we reach around it in a way that as we close our, our, our fingers, we're, we're, we're going to be able to compensate for small errors. Right. And that's what we call a robust grasp that will work even though there's uncertainty in the conditions. And that's really what I've been very interested in in the research front is how can we build robust manipulation that will work even though we have these errors that are inevitable and you know I inherent in the problem. Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure I understand that, it's something like if someone were telling me to pick up a cup, they couldn't they wouldn't tell me kind of the coordinates, I would move my hand toward the cup until I bumped it, kind of. I mean, very lightly, but my hand would get the feedback that I've now touched it and it would curl around it. And that's a much more 
robust thing to do than like possibly get the coordinates slightly wrong and then knock the glass over. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, here's an interesting thing you you just brought up, which is touch, the sense of touch. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No. So a lot of times robots don't have that. And in the in the logistics environment, you don't really have a sense of touch with these suction cups. You know, you, you don't get feedback from them, except you do know if you've if you've picked the object up or not because of the way the airflow works. You can tell if they're if it's been picked up. But in, in humans are making use of very, very nuanced tactile touch sensing. And that is something that we've struggled to, to reproduce. And it's, there, there is very difficult to get a very high accuracy tactile sensor that can tell different shades of pressure and also edges, finding edges and, let's say, textures on objects. Now, human, humans are very good at that. In fact, you can just put a very, like a, something much smaller than a human hair on a surface and you rub your finger across it and you can detect that. Hmm. And it's incredible. It can be like at the, um, I believe it's at the micron level, you can detect wow. a crack in something with your fingers. So we don't know how that works. We can't reproduce it. But we, one thing that has been very ex- exciting in the last few years is optical tactile sensors. And the name for this is often gel sight. And what they have is a gel and, and then a camera inside the gel. So the gel presses on something and the camera inside is looking up. And so as you make contact with that device, you can sort of see the, the contact, if that makes right, sense. Right, right. The gel kind of compresses as the pressure of the thing pushes into it. Right. It's sort of like you see the negative side of it. Like, let's say you're looking, sitting inside, right? And you see the gel deform. And so you can see very fine details. Like, let's say you press on a penny, you can see the whole outline of the head or whatever is printed on the penny. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's really nice. Now, those sensors have become increasingly popular. The price is coming down. There's a number of companies making them. And the the challenge is, though, that they're they're kind of bulky because you have to you know, have the camera position behind it. It's sort of fairly large, larger than a human thumb, say. And then they're also tend to be prone to small errors because um, the the surface gets de- abraded over time. So it sort of wears down, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. A lot of excitement in robotics about these, and we're, we're, we're working with them to try and understand their properties and think about how those will affect grasping and manipulation in the future. Hmm, cool. I guess while we're on the topic of, yeah, kind of recent advances that are making some of these problems easier, is there, if you had to name kind of one most exciting breakthrough in the field of robotics from the last three years, what would it be? Okay, well, there are the big ones over the past... I want to say 12 years is there's they both have to do with depth. The first one is deep learning. That was a huge breakthrough, right? That that's the I I really think of it as two waves of AI that that we've had deep learning that came around 2012 and then almost a decade later there's generative AI. So those are two very fairly distinct breakthroughs. Now, there's another one in robotics which is came around just around the time of deep learning, which is depth sensors. And these were cameras. These had actually existed before, but became very popular. Microsoft put out this thing called the Kinect, which was actually an extension of, a, of some results that, that came out of a lab. And basically were that you could use structured light to perceive the, the depth of, uh, of points in space. Huh. So, yeah, Microsoft used it for a game games and so you could stand in front of your tv and you could move around and the thing and the thing would sense where your body was right in space and so you could you could swing a you know tennis racket and things like that right that was the big xbox was using it right okay wait just make sure i understand the kind of advance it's like if you point a big floodlight say at a person and then asked them to move around you could measure kind of the brightness or something, and that would give you a sense of how far away that person or where they were or where their, how their body was blocking the light and therefore where they were. Okay, let me give you a better example. So what it was a lot, the first wave of this was like, imagine projecting a grid of, of lines 
in, let's say, infrared over the scene, right? So with the right camera, you would see that grid, but you know what the grid looks like. And now you see how the grid is distorted. Yes, and that gives you it. an idea about where those points are in space. Cool. Yeah. So you could build up. Actually, you know what? It's really exactly what you see in a, in a map. In a contour map. A contour map. Yeah, exactly. And that's what they were able to do was that you could point a camera now and build a contour map of the scene. So if it's a person standing there, you could see their body and their face. And so that has turned out to be that being able to do that fast and at lower cost has been another big breakthrough in robotics because now you have a way of getting depth information. Cool. And that has that changed the field dramatically. It was a crucial component to be able to 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 essentially perceive the three dimensional structure of points in space. So it's a really that's an area that I think is huge and not often acknowledged. But that's that that that's sort of the big advantage that's sitting behind the scenes mm -hmm. in a lot of robotic advances. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's one. Um, yeah, is is there another one worth worth talking about? Sure. I mean, tactile sensing is, I would say, this gel site developments has really been interesting. I, I, I think it was still at the early stage of being able to apply it. But one area that we're very excited about is this multimodal learning when this is this is very new and relates more to Gen AI. But in Gen AI, you have this idea, you have a you have a language model, as we talked about, and you also have vision language models that are co-trained using contrastive loss. And the idea being that you can now link words and images together. And so that you can describe something in words and it will generate an image, right? Or vice versa, which is really exciting. Now you can take an image and feed it into Gen AI and it will, it will describe what is in that image. This is very exciting. And this is, for example, I don't know how much you played with um, ChatGPT 4V, or basically the latest version of ChatGPT has this ability. Yeah, and so you can you could just take an image of your table and say what what do you, what's here, and it will it will remarkably tell you. I see a glass over to the left of a plate with a hard boiled egg, and you know it'll just go on and on and tell you really incredible detail. Hmm. So that is that's cross training between vision and language. What people are also doing now is is cross training with tactile images so now you have all three so now what's kind of cool with that is that then you can say okay i feel something with my mm -hmm. tactile sensor what is it what you know what am i feeling and so it can describe it in words or maybe generate an image that's consistent with that that's um, incredible that data yeah and actually now there's even a, an, a we're working on something where we incorporate sound Sound is really interesting because you imagine a really sensitive microphone as you're doing manipulation, it will hear subtle right. interactions. Yeah. And so if we can start cor correlating those with the with emotions, then that actually could end up being a very useful modality. I don't think humans use sound because we're just not that sensitive, but it seems like it would be useful to have microphones and they're inexpensive. We know how to make them, but put those on each of the fingers and just cool. as you're manipulating things, use yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And instead of, you know, using my hand to bump the glass and notice that I bumped it because of the touch sensation, I notice mm -hmm. that I bumped it because of tiny microphones that have heard the bump. Exactly. Exactly. That's amazing. And, and there's another thing which is related to that, Lisa, which is just vibration. So we can detect very fine vibration with our fingers too, and that's subtle. Mm. But you can imagine that a microphone can do that too. So if you're putting, as you make contact, you hear this little bump, but then it has a sort of uh, a frequency associated with it, and that you can use to determine what was the material. Oh, that's so cool. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so you could tell the difference between glass and wood and metal, say. And there's, there's interesting work being go, going on there. Even the new ideas even to introduce another modality, much, which might be temperature or hu humidity, moisture sensors. So you can have all these things built into, and the cross-training is where you take all those examples and you say, okay, let's train a network to be aware of all those different channels and you give it examples where they're all happening simultaneously. So it starts to link them together and then you can pull one of them out and, and the others will replace the one that's missing. They fill in the blanks and that's, that's called cross modal or multimodal learning. And it's, it's, it's a huge advantage 
and, and very exciting. We, you know, we're just at the beginning of being able to use that. And here, here's where I want to come back to the vision language models, which is, I think this does two things for robotics. One is it means that we can start talking to robots in using natural language. And what, I, I, want, I don't want to be overly biased toward English. It could be French or, or Mandarin, Chinese, whatever. But you can now use words and say, pick up the tall tumbler that on the table and the somehow these systems are able to now be able to interpret that and light up the tall tumbler on the table it will just it will just um because it's been seen other tumblers in different environments and it, it correlates that uh visual with that tumbler so the we we have something called language embedded radiance fields which is related to actually i would say another advantage advance which is called nerfs neural radiance fields. These were developed just another three years ago. This is a, a breakthrough both within computer vision and graphics. And that was a technique for being able to take a number of images of a scene and then build a model that can reconstruct any other viewpoint of that scene. That's called a NERF. Wow. And we can use that, 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 so that gives you an ability to essentially look around in a scene and see it from different viewpoints. It's really powerful and it's being used in a number of, um, a number of applications in filmmaking and animation and things. But it also turns out that we can adapt that and now we can combine this, this language elements into it. So now we can look at that scene and start to identify things in the scene. Like you could say a word like find the elements of electricity. And now all the wires and plugs and things will light up and basically get highlighted. It's really interesting, surprising. It seems really big. It seems like, yeah, one of the things closest to this more general purpose thing that I, that, you know, I think people might imagine is on the horizon, but maybe isn't so close on the horizon. But this feels like in that direction. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I don't want to sound negative. I, I want to really applaud and and acknowledge, you know, the wonderful things that are happening. But also at the same time, just point out that these don't mean that we've solved the, all the problems. So, you know, just to just to set the expectations, as we said. But this ability is really interesting because now you can just look at a scene. You can ask, ask a question in that scene, and these new models will be able to identify what parts of the scene are relevant and identify you know, what might need to be done. So if you said clear the table, it might be able to find each object and, and then say, you know, and we can apply techniques to be able to grasp that object and avoid other objects, et cetera. So it's a combination of these breakthroughs in deep learning as well as these new sensors and and developments in hardware that can come together. And it's and, and I would say also the old fashioned, good old fashioned engineering, which I you know, that's that is is so important to remember and, and to keep in mind. But combinations of all of those things, I think, are 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 what we're going are going to be able to get us to increasing our abilities to be able to do these manipulation tasks. Cool. Okay, let's leave that there for now. I want to better understand the kind of barriers to making better and more versatile robots. Um, so we've kind of talked about the ways in which the problem is complex. And yeah, I feel like I have a good handle of that. But I'm curious what the specific kind of technological bottlenecks are. And in your TED Talk, Why Don't We Have Better Robots Yet?, uh, which is really good, and we'll link to it. Um, you talk through three areas that kind of each pose their own challenges. So hardware, software, and then physics. Let's take those in turn. So to start, to what extent is the kind of main barrier to better robots, the hardware? Okay, but I think a misperception that many, many people have, and it, I understand where it comes from, but it's if we want to manipulate things, we should start with a hand like humans have. And mm. so there's this robot hands that, you know, have five fingers and kind of similar to human hands. It turns out that's extremely difficult because the human hand is so complex and versatile and has so much nuance. But if you build a robot hand with all those joints, you have a very high dimensional system. Again, there's a lot of things, moving parts, and it's very difficult to control all those, those joints accurately. Generally, you have to use cables and then cables tend to be 
inaccurate because they stretch and and so and there's something called hysteresis where they if you pull as one direction and you push in another direction they don't kind of come back to the same point and then they're also very heavy these hands and so they every ounce that's in the hand means you can pick up less weight with it right so you have these that that's a big issue and then most of all it's cost so these are extremely expensive, you know, hundred thousand dollars for the for a five fingered hand today. Whoa! So I'm a big fan of the very simple grippers, very very simple parallel jaw, two just basically a pincher, and those you can do amazing things with those. And the example I talk about in the TED talk is 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 surgical robots just have very simple grippers, and surgeons work with them all the time, and then. Of course, every day, half of the earth uses chopsticks to pick up uh, food, right? So it's really, those are very capable. You can do a lot with simple grippers. So that, that's one way I think about the hardware is that we don't need to build these complex hands. But the other issue there is the control, which is that no matter what hand you have, if it's on the end of a robot, you have all these motors that have to be controlled precisely to get the the both of those jaws to a particular point in space and each of those motors has very small error associated with it and by that i mean you can you can command the motor to go to a specific point and mathematically we can tell what where we want that motor to be but that motor may not actually be there and it's because there's gears small errors in the gears and friction other things that cause problems so you, 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 what you have is, is we, it's a precision. How far, how close can you get to a desired point in space? So that's a problem. And, but there's a really nice breakthrough there, which is that you can use deep learning to compensate for those errors. Hmm. And we've had some really nice success, especially with surgical robots, being able to do that in the last couple of years. So we can, we can actually address that to some degree, but not perfectly. So that's the first real challenge. The, the second is perception. And perception is, as, is, is quite difficult with cameras that if you even have stereo camera, you still can't really find, build a, a map of where everything is in space. It's just very difficult. And mm. I know that sounds surprising because humans are very good at this. Uh, in fact, even with one eye, we can, we can navigate and we can clear the dinner table. But it seems that we're building in a lot of understanding and intuition about what's happening in the world and where objects are and how they behave. So, it, but for robots, it's very difficult to get a perfectly accurate model of the world and where things are. So again, if you're going to go manipulate or grasp an object, small error in that, in that position will maybe have your robot crash into the object, right? A glass, um, you know, a delicate wine glass and probably break it. Right. So the perception and the control are both problems. And then the other one that's more subtle and, and I think really interesting is in physics. And the nuance there is that you can imagine just take up a, a pencil or pen, put it in front of you on a flat table, and then just push it with one finger forward. And what will happen is it'll, it'll move you know, for a minute and then it'll, it'll rotate away from your, your finger as you do it. Right. Now, why does that happen? It turns out that it really depends on the very, very microscopic details of the the surface of your table and the shape of your pencil. Hmm. And those are essentially making contacts and breaking contacts as you're moving it along, hmm. as you're pushing it. And so the, the nature of those contacts is impossible to perceive because they're underneath the pencil. So you, right. by looking down, you can't see what's going on. And so you really can't predict how that pencil is going to move. So it's, it, and this is an, an example of, a, of really an undecidable problem. I mean, it's unsolvable. And I like to say, you know, you don't have to go into quantum physics to find a very, very <laughs> difficult problems that can't be, that, that, that inherently cannot be solved. Like there's no, it's not a matter of getting better sensors or better physics models, but we just can never predict that. We'll never be able to because it depends on this, these, these conditions which we can't perceive. So we have to find ways to compensate for these, um, all three of these factors, 
which is the, the control errors, the perception errors, and the physics errors, I call it. And those humans do it. We have an existence proof. We know it can be done. And, and humans have the same limitations, right? So how do we do it? And that's the, that's the million dollar question or billion dollar question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I, well, that made me want to ask, you said an, it's an unsolvable problem um, and maybe I'm just kind of misunderstanding, but do you mean that it's unsolvable with the perception we have now for robotics? Because... I don't know exactly kind of where the pencil I push on the table is going to end up, but I do manipulate pencils and make pretty good predictions about what would happen if I, yeah, nudged it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you do. And, but you can't, what I mean is that it's, you cannot predict exactly where that pencil is going to move if mm, you start to okay. push it. So humans can't right? do it as well, this thing that you're talking about. Right, right. No one can. I'm saying that no model in the universe can solve this problem because it huh. depends on what's happening at the at the really um, almost sub microscopic level that is basically going to influence how that pencil responds to being pushed. And I it's, see. it's it's friction, but in a very nuanced way. And you know, in friction, we have this model we all learn in college or in high school called Coulomb friction. And it's a, it's a reasonable approximation, but it's very a rough approximation to the real world. And it doesn't, it doesn't really describe what happens when you push an object across a surface, uh, how it's going to move. And so that this is known to be a very, very nuanced and subtle problem. And it's right in front of us. And you're right, we, we solve it. What I want to say solve it means not predict it exactly. What we do is we compensate for the error. Right by the scooping kind of motion where we move our fingers in a way around the object and we have a word for that we call it caging which is caging caging is where you put your fingers around an object in such a way that it is caged meaning that it can't escape so it can move around it can rattle around inside that cage but it can't get out of the cage so once you put your fingers in a cage around the object now you start to close your fingers. Well, there's nowhere for the object to go. So <laughs> right. it generally will end up in your, you'll be able to pick it up. Yeah. If in, I'm catching a small ball, I, the motion is going to be for my fingers to come around as much of it as they can so that mm -hmm. when I clasp, it's going to, even if I can't quite, I don't know, move it in the exact direction I want, the fingers are just going to trap it. Right. And, you know, ball is a great example. So if you think of a, of a, a you know, a, a, I don't know, I don't want to use baseball because that's such an American thing, but you have <laughs> this glove, right, that's big. Right. And, and, and we, yeah, we sometimes call the, we think about this as a funnel that when you funnel the uncertainty down and it sort of use the natural physics. A funnel is, is a beautiful example, right? If you want to funnel a bunch of uh, rice into a tiny opening, you use a funnel and then the rice sort of manages to find its way down just using physics. Right. And you're not predicting how to get the rice to fall at the right angle into the jar or whatever. Exactly. 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 You're just setting up physical constraints such that it sort of works. And that is really the secret to, I think, to robotics. If we can figure out how to do those kind of things, generalized funnels, then we can we can really we can start to do you know start to move up that ladder of the dexterity of humans. Yep. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Are are there other kind of hardware, software, physics challenges worth talking about? Well, the 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 challenges of perception get especially difficult when you have reflections and tr and transparencies. Um, that that becomes extremely difficult because. It, any sensor is depending on the behavior of light. And when light is unpredictable, and for example, underwater is very challenging, right? And if you have, um, if you're moving around, lighting is turns out to be itself complicated. So a lot of times we'll be working in the lab, we'll get something working. And then that afternoon, we'll have a sponsor come in and it won't work. <laughs> and hmm. we're like, what happened? Well, the lighting has changed. And it's just because the it's later in the day and 
the very subtle change of lighting has caused our sensors to not work anymore. And it's because they've adjusted to one lighting conditions. And now when you change them, even slightly, humans are amazingly good at adapting to changes of lighting. But robot, that's a challenge for robots. And this, by the way, is one of the huge challenges in, in autonomous vehicles because there's these very rare lighting conditions where the light just, you, know, you get glare and that's where the system doesn't see something it's never seen before and it crashes. So this is the, these variations in lighting. The human eye is incredibly adaptive to changes and we, we do it without, you know, unconsciously we can manage. But that, that is still a challenge. Yeah, yeah, that's another case where it just would never have crossed my mind that the time, the lighting of the time of day, uh, would be part of a part of the robotics challenge. Because oh, it is, it is. It would never have occurred to me that my body is doing anything particularly interesting at sunset relative to noon. Right, and it's very true, and and actually, it happens all the time in in industry where you have these systems and they're you know, in environments with you know, humans and the lighting changes. And sometimes it can be subtle things like even um, changes in temperature and humidity have a big effect in robotic environments. Like for our logistics systems, all the packages can change. They can swell. So if it's really hot, and sometimes it gets very hot in these environments, the packages swell. So imagine you have a nice box, but now it's swollen. So what happens is it's not flat anymore. So when the suction cups come in, it's sort of almost like um, curved or sphere spherical. Slightly convex or something. Yeah. Yeah, convex. And so when you put your, your sensors on it, they don't make contact cleanly. And it's just like it worked yesterday, but it doesn't work today because it was just more humid and more and more hot. Yeah, I guess I'm still personally very curious about how robots are going to be integrated into the real world in the near future. Are there going to be any cases of kind of near term integration in particular sectors? OK, well, for example, I think the a huge area of demand is going to be home care, for example, and that is taking care of people who are aging. And the reason this is relatively near-term need is just the demographics. We have an aging population in almost every country and a shortage of workers, which is why I'm not worried about people being massively unemployed. I, I, I think we're going to have plenty of jobs and, and, and a shortage of, of human workers for a long time. But in these home care type of settings, that's where there's already a huge shortage. And it's gonna, this is going to increase dramatically in the next decade. We're going to, I mean, it's inevitable. This is, by the way, not a speculation because it's about demographics. We know how many people were born and died and we know what the population looks like, right? This is, it is collision course for a massive imbalance in, in the age population. And when that, as that starts to, to evolve, we're going to need help there. Now, I think that I can imagine this fairly clearly because, you know, I'm getting closer to that age and my parents, my mother is. And I, I think mm -hmm. about today, it's very hard to find help, to afford help, to have human workers help in the home. And there's a lot of concern about finding someone who's trustworthy and, and capable and, and reliable you know, that combination is rare. And the alternative is, you know, I would love to have a robot that could do some of these things around my house. So what would that be? Well, things like just keeping the house clean, decluttering, that, that would be really helpful. I would love to be able to have things just sort of kept orderly. For example, actually, you know, people talk about robots cooking you know, meals for you. I don't really, I like cooking, so, <laughs> uh -huh. but I don't like cleaning up. So I would love the robot to do that, right? And then it would just like straighten up your desk and pick up clothes, put them away, fold your laundry, you know, all those kind of things around the house. Make your bed that I think would be very welcomed and, and, and beneficial. And so I think we're getting closer to that, some of those capabilities. And that would be very helpful in you know, huge demand for that. And I think that the challenge, of course, is going to be cost because... You need to produce these at a, at a level that people can afford them. But that might be, if you get a real breakthrough in the capabilities, then these costs might go down. 
with volume. So just like cars, cars are very complex. They have a lot of moving parts, but most people can afford a car, maybe not a new one, but you, um, you get the economy of scale, right? So that could happen. And I think that we'll also have... The hope is that these robots, if we start to bootstrap and these robots are out there, then we could collect data as they move and continue. And then those data can start helping fill this huge gap that we're talking about. And then these robots will get better over time. So I think that that's, that's one, one category down the road. There's one, one thing that's already happening, and that's logistics. The logistics is, is basically moving materials around and transportation of materials. Okay, so you have a huge economy of this, and the way most people see it is in their delivery service. When they order something you know, online, then that package comes to them, and the, lo- the logistics is basically how that happens, how that thing gets transported, that whatever you ordered gets transported to your door. And there's a lot of steps. It has to be found in a warehouse. It has to be put into a a box or package, and then it has to be delivered to a central place and then to a more localized and then all the way down to a delivery person who drives it over and drops it on your front porch. So that whole thing, and by the way, it exists in business too, because businesses are constantly ordering and uh, things and storing things, et cetera. So this whole giant, giant area of logistics is something that has been around, is very important, but most people don't really see it. You don't Most see consumers, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's invisible. It's a, it's a sort of invisible economy that's out there, but it's all the things that go on behind the scenes to get you your packages and uh, on time, right? So that's an area that has become more challenging because of e-commerce is continuing to rise. People are really like this idea of ordering online for all kinds of reasons, and it's it's addictive in the sense that once you get hooked on it, you start doing it more and more. And COVID had a big boost, you know, by, by necessity, we had to do a lot more ordering online. So what happened is there was a real surge in the amount of, of logistics that needs to be handled. And it turns out that robots, the, current, the recent breakthroughs in robots are very well matched to handling that problem. And by way that, I mean sorting packages, moving packages right. around. That is something robots are capable of. And they're actually starting to be adopted in many different places. And that's, that's not science fiction. That's not future. Hmm. That's happening today. Right. And what are the kind of specific subtasks that they're doing that, you know, they can do? Because it sounds a lot like grasping to me, but we can't, robots can't reliably grasp yet. Well, okay, great question, Louisa. So it's very difficult for robots to say clear a dinner table. And that's because dinner tables are complex. They have a lot of fragile objects, transparent objects, shiny objects. That those are all those are all particularly challenging for robots right now. But packages have some nice qualities to them. Generally, they're opaque and they have usually some flat surfaces, and so they can be grasped. They're still non-trivial. For example, in a bin. If you dump a bunch of packages in there, the boxes are all different, you know, just randomly arranged. And now you finding out how you can grasp those objects is non-trivial. And, and, and the way that I say grasp them is usually it's done with suction cups. And you have to reach in and you have to find out where you can put the suction cup that won't bump into something else or break something else. Right. So that problem is actually harder than you might think is how to get objects out of a bin. With suction cups, um, I know it sounds it sounds easy, but it, it, it does. It just sounds yeah. ridiculous to me. And yet, I did watch a video of suction cups sorting packages, and you do really notice. And then when you kind of try to empathize, like, oh, what would I do? You do notice that you have to think about where the suction cup goes to distribute the weight and how not to. Yeah, bump other things, as you said. And it really is just a lesson for me in how complex things that seem incredibly simple to me are. But good. anyways, it sounds like that is a thing that we're doing better. 
Yes. So if you had to do it, and what, and by the way, humans do this all the time, is you reach in with two hands and you reach your fingers around this box and you lift it up and you, and, and you sort of push other things away with your wrist as you do it to get that object out, you know, that box and then put it there. Now, robots generally are operating with one hand. So that's one big challenge. Second of all, they have this huge wrist because if you look at a robot, it's very bulky because it's got this big motors on the round near the wrists and also this big suction head which by the way is not just one suction cup it usually has up to a you know dozen suction cups on it so it's this big huge thing that it's trying to reach in and now it has to approach that box from the right direction and if the box is on its side and you know just a corner of it you have to kind of come in at the right angle and there's a lot of other boxes so you have to figure out where to reach in to get the box and then, as you said, very importantly, once you get a hold of it and you start pulling, now all of a sudden it can slip off if because the suction cups can be sheared off and if you twist it, it will fall. So a lot of nuances, but we've made a huge amount of progress on that. And so my company, Ambi Robotics, is doing that every day. And we have very good tools for being able to, to, to lift objects out of bins. We're also... The other step is scanning objects. And this is, this is also a little trickier than you might think. When you go to the supermarket, right, you know how the objects get scanned for the barcode? True. So it turns out it's very, there's a nuanced aspect to that, which if now, if you, nowadays you have to do it yourself, right? And many times the self-checkout and you realize yeah, right. it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. You have to find the barcode visually and then stick it in front of the scanner, right? So... That's tricky because a lot of times the barcode is not obvious and you have to you have to find it, as we said, lifting it up with a suction cup. But sometimes you, you scan it and you don't see the barcode. And that could be for two reasons. Even if you have multiple cameras around, the barcode might be covered up by the gripper, which is a big problem, or the barcode is damaged. And that means that it got scraped or something. So it, and there's a million reasons that it gets smudged or scraped or something. And then you can't read it. Now that all has to happen. And then you have to take that once you, if you've read it correctly, now you have to drop it in another place where it gets moved to a, a separate bin or bag, depending on whatever the barcode says. Cause you're trying to basically distribute it back out so that you can get it out to ultimately that that postal worker who's going to carry it and drop it in your house, right? That delivery person. So you have to get it to their bag, into their vehicle that's associated with your house. So those steps are, um, we're, we're actually making enormous progress there. And those things are practical and cost-effective and they're being adopted. And it's really exciting to watch that, that area be transformed by machines now. And so what we've done is with our machines, Ambi Robotics has these machines in a number of facilities now, but they're, they're, they're basically helping workers to be more productive. So the workers love these machines and they, they're getting raises and then they're eliminating the job that nobody wants to do, which is reaching into the heavy bin, um, lifting out heavy things. But they're now their job is to maintain these machines Right, so they can get much more work done per person, and so the job becomes more pleasant, and then the whole shipping center can handle more things. So there's still plenty of jobs to go around. I'm not, and also want to say, I'm not saying nobody it doesn't eliminate some jobs, but it's not what we're talking about about wiping out all jobs. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that take. Um, I actually want to come back to how robots might affect the labor market in in a few minutes, but. First, um, yeah, I, I'd like to understand a bit more about the integration of robots into other sectors. Um, so, yeah, what, what roles might robots play in agriculture and food production in the near future? Okay, good. That's, a, that's another one that's very, like logistics, is challenging because there, it, there's not enough workers. And it's also, it, it's seasonal, and, and by the way, logistics is seasonal too. Around the holidays, you have a huge surge in packages coming out, right? And so in agriculture, it's very seasonal where there's like this harvest period and all of a sudden you need, you know, a hundred times more workers than you needed three weeks ago. 
And the, the harvests often are simultaneous in many different places, so everybody's rushing to get workers. And it would be great to have machines that can help with harvesting. There is also machines that are helpful maintaining weed, you know, weeding. And um, one of the things we've been really excited about is the idea of managing pruning plants um, when we're growing in polyculture environments. So this is called intercropping. It's becoming increasingly popular because it's, it's an old technique. Obviously, it's a way people still um, tend to garden. It's the, 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 the contrast between polyculture and monoculture. So most industrial farms are monoculture, just like row after row of soybeans, right? The same thing. Well, the, the challenge is that you have to use a fairly high amount of pesticides and fertilizers and water if you use polyculture, you're, you're using the, the natural benefits of plants helping each other so that a lot of times you can get away with far less pesticides, fertilizers, and water if you use this polyculture. And so it's very popular, for example, if you look in, in the wine industry, that organic wines are often grown with this intercropping with lots of different crops around the vineyards so that they kind of help pollinate and support the vineyard. Sure. The grapes. So, but these require lots more complex, much more labor because you have to prune things and everything is changing at different rates. So that's an area where I think robots could be really interesting and be able to move through an environment and trim and maintain farms. That sounds really hard to me. Like that one, I actually do have like a visceral sense of <laughs> good <laughs> that sounds challenging are you a gardener do you have a garden i do have a garden and i'm i basically am just relying on easy plants and it rains a lot in the uk and so the garden does pretty well <laughs> but right knowing what to prune how to come at the right angles mm -hmm. traversing outdoor environments that all does sound much harder so is that far away um or am I am I just really inexperienced at gardening? And so no, uh, no, it's it's a hard problem, and you're you're not you're not alone. I think Michael Pollan has this great quote: "Nature abhors a garden," <laughs> which is basically you know gardens are very hard to grow, and mm -hmm. you know, and England has a great rich history of 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 beautiful gardens, uh, beautiful manicured and just you know aesthetically beautiful. Uh, and, and of course, there's the European gardens that are semi wild, and all these things. There's a whole beautiful history of gardening for aesthetic purposes. But then, in terms of farming and and growing edible plants, then you have a lot of other considerations, and it's very it is very complex because you know pests come in, and all of a sudden something's eating your plant. You have, don't know what to do about that. And you have to prune, and even something like lettuce, how you continuously prune it to take off the leaves that are edible, but keep the plant growing. A lot of nuances. So you're right, this is beyond the current capabilities of robots, but I think that there's some of this that could be, I, just imagining in the future, you could imagine that you have some something like this, uh, that it, let's say is able to, and this is something we're working on in the lab, is being able to, let's say, find stems on a, a plant and then prune particular leaves, dead leaves, or maybe to extract the healthy leaves that you want to harvest. Right. That would be, that's, that's, that's interesting. So I think you can imagine that coming. And there's a lot of, you know, benefits, right? You could have these systems and increase the food production, especially for fresh produce, which is something, you know, would be very, very desirable. And reducing water usage because water, because of climate change is an enormous issue. Right now, and we've had major droughts in many areas, and this is persistent; it's not going away. And so, being able to have indoor farms that have um, robot assistance would be very helpful. And I do think that we're going to see this is going to increase over the next, even the next decade. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Let's take one more sector. How about um, surgery? Great. Can we talk about that? Absolutely. Okay, because I that's one I'm very excited about, and. Here's why, that surgery is, and, and healthcare more broadly, but surgery is really interesting because there's very big difference between different surgeons, the skill level. 
it varies widely. So in particular, that it, let's say something like suturing, which is sewing okay. up a sewing up a, a wound, there it has to if it's done right, if it's done well, that means you have nice even distribution of the forces on the wound. Mm-hmm then you'll get very, very efficient healing and little scarring. But if you, if you don't do it so well, it's a little sloppy, then you can have a lot of complications. Things don't heal properly and you get a big, ugly scar. Now, my father-in-law had summed this up. He said he was a surgeon and he said he could look at a, 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 a scar and he knew which surgeon did the operation. Wow. Right, because he 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 was took a lot of pride in his ability to suture and his skill in that, and he said, you know, he knew all the surgeons and on how how good they were. Now, so coming to robotics, this would be something where I think robots could help. And again, not replacing the surgeon, but imagine that you're in the operating room and we have these systems now, these robot assistants. And the way they work now is it's completely controlled by the human surgeon. So it's like a puppet. But, you know, completely, um, there's no, no sense of, um, of robotics there at all. But what we're, now, what we're calling augmented dexterity is that we can introduce a little bit of robotics into these contexts. And it's very analogous to self-driving cars. We're not saying we're going to have a fully self-driving surgeon, Right, where the surgeon is is off golfing and the and the robot is doing the surgery. No, right. The surgeon is always going to be there. And again, this I I think will need surgeons for a, the my lifetime, the foreseeable future, thirty, forty years, okay, at least. But the surgeon could be augmented by having this system that would allow them to perform this surgery or the suturing in a very nice, you know, optimized way, so that the suture is very clean. And even and results in fast healing and, and limited scarring. And so that's another thing we're working on. And I think that is going to come also in the next decade. Cool. And so what is the robotics problem of suturing like really concretely? It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> okay, it's very tricky. And here it starts with the needle, which is very, very difficult to even perceive because you know, the, the classic needle in a haystack. So what you have here is surgical needles are curved. They're like a, a C, the letter C, um, for a variety of reasons, but that's because you're, you're sewing into skin. So they're always curved like that. But they're very thin and shiny. So they have the, all these problems we talk about where just finding the needle is hard. Right. Okay, so we've been working on a number of techniques using ultraviolet light and other things to train a robot to be able to perceive needles. And those seem to be showing promise. So we're very excited about that. Cool. Yeah, so we've been, we have a demonstration where a robot can hand a needle back and forth between two robot uh, grippers uh, 50 times in a row, which is, uh, I'm very excited about that. The next step is, though, once you find the needle, is to be able to is to manipulate it in so that you can f- find the right point for the entry and the exit in the wound and then push the needle through and then you have to grasp the tip of the needle with the other gripper and pull it right through there and get the right amount of tension right because you don't want to over you want to get it just right so it it holds the wound but not as it pinch the the blood circulation and then you have to hand it back to the first jaw to do another stitch. And then you have this interesting problem, Louisa, which is thread management, which is that the thread tends to get in your way. Right. I'm laughing because, again, I would never have labeled these things as <laughs> tasks or kind of subtasks. But there are so many. But sorry, you were saying thread management gets in the way. Thread management, and it's a it's a really issue, complex issue because again the thread is almost impossible to see. It's even harder than the needle, and the thread tends to sort of get in the way in the most um, fiendish ways, and it's very it's you get tangled up. And so sur- human surgeons are very good at managing this, and so when we watch videos of of human surgeons, we see how they're doing it. We're trying to develop strategies for robots that can do something. So we've gotten up to being able to to do six stitches in a row. 
and with a robot fully autonomous, no human in the loop. Wow. So that that's a brand new result. We just presented it, in fact, yesterday at a conference. Congratulations. Thank you. And that so that's that's one step, but it's still not ready for for human, you know, uh, application. But I think that that's another area that we're going to be able to get some levels of autonomy, augmenting surgeons' ability, augmented dexterity for surgeons. And that will, you can see that that can have big benefits for healthcare. Yeah, yeah, for, of course. Um, just because you've piqued my curiosity, why do you think we won't have fully autonomous robot surgeons in the next 30, 40 years? Okay, so the the issue here is fault tolerance. And this is where, and, and I'm glad you brought it up because this is why self-driving cars are particularly complicated and challenging because they're, they're, they're prone to a small fault, a small error could be quite disastrous, right, as you know. And you could, if you're driving on a cliff, you know, small error and you go over the side or you, you know, bump into a stroller, or run over a, a kid. Um, so the, driving is, is very challenging because of that. In contrast to logistics, because in logistics, you drop a package. It's no big deal. In fact, it happens all the time. In fact, they expect it to happen a fairly large amount of time. Mm-hmm. You know, so something like 1% of packages get dropped. It's not, it's Okay. That's not a big deal. So you can live with it. But um, in, in driving is, is, is not very fault tolerant. In surgery, even less. So you have to be really careful because you don't want to puncture an organ or, or something or sew two things together that shouldn't be sewn together, right? So there's a huge consequence. The other thing, Louisa, is perception because now you have inside the body, you, you have, it's very challenging because there you have a lot of, a, oftentimes there's blood, or if it's a laparoscopic um, surgery, you're 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 constantly, essentially trying to avoid the blood and staunch out the blood so that you can see what's right. going on. And this is where, just as you were describing, watching a robot, uh, someone make an egg, crack an egg. Surgeons have developed this really good intuition because they know what the organs are, they know what they're what they should look like, how they're positioned, and how they're how um, thick or rough, or their, their, their surfaces and their materials are. So they have very good intuition behind that. So th- they can operate, sometimes the, there's a blood, you cut a, um, a blood vessel and the whole volume fills with blood. And now you have to st- find that blood vessel and clip it, clamp it so that you can stop the blood. And that's like right. you reaching into a, into a sink filled with, with murky water and finding the thing, right? So. And surgeons are very good at that, right? And it's a lot of nuance. So um, the, the the perception problem is extremely difficult because everything is is cur- is deformable. Materials are particularly difficult for robots. So you know we talked about cracking an egg or or clearing a dinner table. Generally, all those objects are rigid, but when you start getting into deformable things like cables or fabrics or bags uh, or, or a human body, right now all of a sudden everything is kind of just bending and, and, and movable in very, very complex ways. And that's very hard to model, simulate, or, um, or perceive. Right. Yeah. I'm just finding it fascinating, the, like, the categories of things that are really, really troublesome, thorny problems for robots are just not what I'd expect. I mean, the fact that you can, you know, we're making progress on suturing, but it gets really complicated as soon as an organ, you know, you could move it and it would, you, it's, it's hard to predict how it's going to look when it moves or where it's going to be is just, yeah, it's just um, unexpected and really interesting. Absolutely. And I think, you, you know, I'm just as you're saying this, I'm thinking of going back to the kitchen, you know, kitchen workers, in um, restaurants, you know, so much nuance going on there. You know, if you're chopping vegetables or you're, you know, unpacking things out of a, you know, let's say um, every single chicken breast is slightly different, right? And so being able to manipulate those kind of things and then clean surfaces and wipe things and stir and all, there's so many complex nuances. So I think it's going to be a long time before we have a really fully automated kitchen you know, systems. 
And the same is true for plumbers and carpenters, electricians, you know, anyone who's basically doing these kind of manual tasks, fixing a car, they're very, very, require a vast amount of nuance. And so those, we, those are not going to, those jobs are going to be very difficult to automate. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I want to ask next. Um, how much do you expect the job market to be changed, affected uh, with the increased presence of robots? So here's where I also think there's a huge amount of fear out there. And it's really important to reassure workers that this is not imminent and that what they do is very valuable and, and, and safe from automation. <laughs> I, I think this, everyone's been saying for years that we're going to have, you know, factories, lights out factories, and that, you know, humans will just sit around and, you know, have all this leisure time, you know, maybe even like Wally or something, right? Um, but no, it's not, we're very far from that. And the, the, the fact is that there's so many nuances to what humans do in jobs. And, you know, AI is a whole realm of office workers and what they do. And I think that there's certainly many aspects of jobs that can be automated. And, you know, for example, transcribing this interview is a perfect example where in the past it had to be done by a human. Now you get a machine to do most of it. Then you tune it. You know, you still have to fine tune it, but you get a lot of the basic elements done. So right, we have a lot of tools that make certain aspects of our job. But then what we do is we spend more time because every other aspect of our job needs more attention than we have. So we can spend time on that, right? So same is true for, for so many of these things we're talking about. So gardeners, et cetera, you know, um, there will be need for, there'll, there'll still be a need for the gardener to be doing the more subtle things, but maybe some machine will be out there and, you know, doing the lawn, Right, we're getting closer to automated lawnmowers, and so for workers, I think you know certain things in the kitchen may be automated. And obviously, we have dishwashers; we have certain automation already we've had for a long time. So, but that doesn't mean we don't need human workers. And so, I think we're going to need them for things that are that are much more subtle. And 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 so, I, I'm very, I'm not, I'm I'm sort of optimistic about the job market. I think that, you know, because of this demographic thing, that that's the biggest factor, which is that we have a shortage of, of human workers, people who are of work age. And so I don't think, you know, there's going to be this kind of unemployment that people are talking about or fearing for a foreseeable future. Yeah. If in, I don't know, let's say 10, 20 years robots are super widespread and are causing real job displacement. What do you think played out differently to how you expected? Well, okay, so let's say one of these breakthrough these breakthroughs we're talking about happens and all of a sudden then robots are capable of learning from YouTube videos and then repeating anything they watch. Or maybe you demonstrate this is how I want to, you know, chop these vegetables and now it's able to repeat that reliably. So if that if we got those breakthroughs, then you could imagine that you'd have you'd have these these robots. Another factor we haven't even touched on, which is not as interesting, but just the cost, the 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 financials of sure. of, of doing these right. So, um, but let's say that gets finessed too. So now all of a mm-hmm. sudden you have these robots, and they're actually pretty capable, and we're seeing them, you know, increasingly being put to use and actually doing something useful then I think it will be interesting. I think that would change our perceptions of them. My own sense is that we would find new work for humans to do, that we would basically shift toward other things that are more subtle. Like, let's say, maybe it's healthcare and things like that, right? We have shortage of, of humans that can do those things and also teaching and childcare. And there's a lot of things we, we are just still shorthanded so I think that people will, will find new, new jobs, but some of these things might be automated. And, but I, I don't, I mean, I guess the, the extreme form of this is that you have a robot that can do anything that a human can do, and you just have them doing it all. And then what? So we, we, we hang out, we, 
we can spend time playing music and, um, you know, writing poetry and doing all the fun stuff. And it was, it's an interesting prospect. Yeah. Right. I mean, maybe we'll drive ourselves crazy <laughs> because we'll have so much free time, you know? Yeah. I do find that that question really hard to actually grapple with. On the one hand, I do feel kind of terrified of losing my job and sense of purpose and ways to fill my time. And on the other hand, I'm like, probably I could, I could fill my time. Probably I could find ways to be pretty, pretty fulfilled. Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be, for what you do, you know, as, as a, a journalist, as a, um, you know, content creator, you know, there's, I think there's always going to be an audience. People want to hear um, things and they're going to want human Humans. innovation there. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I think in the arts and humanities, there's going to be a lot of safety. I really don't. People talk about journalists being replaced. I don't see that at all because journalists, what they bring is is novel and interesting perspectives. You know, they're not just summarizing some piece of some bunch of facts. That's true. That can be replaced. But coming up with novel insights into, you know, scenarios, that's that's very complex and, and nuanced. And I think people will want that for a long time. So, you know, I think I think humans are going to have a, a very positive future for a very long time, and that the the fear is exaggerated, and the optimism, you know, that we're I guess it's a mix of optimism and fear that so, suddenly we're going to have this automated world around us is not something that I think we we should be you know thinking about is anything at all imminent. That you know, we it's it's really I see it as a part of a, a process that's been happening for hundreds of years since the industrial revolution. There's going to be you know steps, but what seems to always happen is humans adapt and and shift our attention and our our time to other things that are somehow more constructive in most cases. Although you know, with social media and the addictive nature of of TikTok and other things, who knows? I don't know. Let's turn to our last topic, which is robotics and art. So, uh, yeah, you are, you're an engineer, you're a roboticist, uh, but you're also an artist. And a lot of your art is kind of at the intersection of robotics and art. And one of your pieces is called The Telegarden. It's a live garden tended by a robot controlled by over 100,000 people via the Internet. Can you say a bit about how it works? Sure. It's still one of, it's still, I would say, my favorite project. It started in the early days of the internet. And I had been making art with robots, painting with robots, and doing installations when the internet came out in 1993, or when I learned of it. And I suddenly saw that I wanted to contribute, and we had robot in the lab, and I wanted to build a robot system that people could interact with. And so my students and I started working on this. We, the, it evolved into the telegarden. And we liked the idea of the contrast between the natural physicality of a garden and this digital world of robots and the internet. And what we didn't expect was how many people were going to get interested in this. Huh. And, but it was the first participatory system where you could not only look at things with a camera, but you could also interact with something remote. And so it attracted a lot of attention. It was an art installation on the web for a year in our lab. And then we got, it got invited to be in an art museum in, in Austria, in Europe. Amazing. And so they maintained it for nine years. Wow. Yeah. So it, it was online 24 hours a day. And so that's how it grew to 100,000 or more people. We don't know exactly how many people were involved. But they were able to plant and water seeds. And as a gardener, you know that you, if you have a three meter by three meter plot of land, you can't, you can't sustain that many people. So it was also a study in the tragedy of the commons because you just couldn't support that many. So we, people would plant tr- things, they would grow at different rates. And then periodically we'd have to wipe the garden clean and start over. Huh. And uh, people would not. The people were very passionate about their plants, and very. And it was fascinating to us. And that is fascinating. So yeah, and it was it was really an artwork in the sense that it was something you could 
fairly easy to understand the telegarden and this idea. Some people said it was the future of gardening, which was <laughs> not our intention. We were <laughs> seeing it almost as a little bit of a critique of the expectations around the internet. Right. And saying, you know, the gardening would be hopefully the last thing you'd want to do online. But uh, it was it was really it was interesting, and we've evolved that recently. We I wanted to revisit that project, and so we over the actually just before the pandemic we started developing a, a new system that we call Alpha Garden, and that's that's a related to the Alpha Go and um, Alpha Zero projects. And what we wanted to do was to build a completely autonomous garden controlled by a robot and AI. So no human in the loop. Wow. And that was very fun and it's ongoing. In fact, we we built that system and we, we was time to be in an art exhibit in New York City that opened, I went to the opening in New York and then the pandemic happened the week after. And we had to close down, the, the, the garden was in a greenhouse controlled by the robot and we could watch it, but we couldn't go into the greenhouse. So we had to just sit and watch it over a period of four weeks and it essentially was drying up because we couldn't get to irrigate it. So it was fascinating to watch this thing. And not what I expected, but the garden started in the last stages to throw up all these flowers and tendrils up. And and it reminded me of Picasso's Guernica Hmm. painting. Because it was like reaching out for desperately for attention and trying to get, you know, just like it was it was slowly dying and you were watching in front of it and it was just trying to strive to stay alive. Last efforts. Right. Yeah. And so it was really beautiful to watch that um, process of a tragic. And it was also interesting in regard to what was happening with the this worldwide pandemic at the same time, because you had, you know, this 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 sort of aberration in nature that nobody expected and, and couldn't, couldn't solve with all the technology we have. Hmm. So it was very interesting that, you know, with all these advances in AI were completely powerless with regard to something, you know, Mother Nature was, had, had developed something that we couldn't, we couldn't control. So I'm really interested in, in this aspect, Louisa, of contrasting using art to raise questions about this technologies the to to in a way critique or challenge the conventional wisdoms about them because that's where i think you know the robots and things are so as we we've talked about have there's so many mythologies and 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 histories and cultural memories about robots and so they're they're interesting as a medium for art and so the more recent project we've done is I've worked with a dancer, Katie Kwan, who is a professional ballet dancer, but also has a PhD in robotics. And she's remarkable. And we started working together just a few over the last few years and just exploring ideas and trying things out. And, and we were having her dance with a robot arm and we were using her motions, using motion capture and something called open pose, which is uses AI to track the position of the joints in a human. And then as she danced, we captured her motions and then basically interpreted those motions into sinusoids and had the robot move in, and somewhat analogously. Hmm. And then she came back into the lab and danced with the robot as it moved. And we really got interested in that, the sort of pal- the contrast between the two. And then we were invited to perform that in a, a space in Brooklyn, New York, called National Sawdust. And Katie said I, she wanted to do it as, a, as an eight-hour performance. And so I was really impressed with her ambition and, um, and, and uh, you know, just about imagine being on stage for eight hours solid dancing. But she's, she's terrific, and we, we did it. We brought the robot to to New York, it was so much fun. We had this um, industrial arm moving on stage and we had choreographed a number of motions and it really became uh, a, uh, we wanted to contrast the, the, the sort of, a lot of the fears around robots stealing jobs mm. with the incredible nuance of the human body. Right. And so she was, 
she was doing motions suggestive of of different aspects of work like stirring and painting and um and basically manual labor and then her motions were in contrast to the motions of the arm and what was interesting is how much more nuanced and complex and ultimately interesting it was her motion compared to what the robot could do i've seen obviously just a snippet of this and um, i found it really beautiful and kind of now after our conversation i do feel like i see it in a slightly new light um where it feels like it is a great example of a lot of the things we've talked about already. The human body is incredibly complex. It's doing much more uh, complex motion sensing, yeah, et cetera, than, than we perceive. And robots can imitate bits of that, but there's a bunch they can't. And juxtaposing those uh, is a great way to kind of see that really viscerally. Thank you. Yes, it's really, I have to give credit to Katie because she's mm. just so expressive in, in her emotion. And you see that the human body is so complex and, as you said, capable. And that, that's ultimately, I've, I've learned more about robots and worked with robots over the last 40 plus years. That's been the, you know, I constantly am reminded of how how complex and magnificent the human body is. Hmm. That's a perfect place to leave it. My guest today has been Ken Goldberg. Thank you so much for coming on. It's <laughs> been really fascinating. Thank you, Louisa. Really fun talking to you. All right. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Content editing by me, Katie Moore, and Kieran Harris. Audio engineering by Ben Cordell, Milo McGuire, Simon Monsoor, and Dominic Armstrong. Full transcripts and an extensive collection of links to learn more are available on our site and put together, as always, by Katie Moore. Thanks for joining. Talk to you again soon.